We'll be analyzing the kinematics of a drop jump in two different subjects. One is an experienced jumper and one is not an experienced jumper. First, we'll look at the drop from hip height in sagittal view. The first of our four phases is initial toe contact. This begins when the subject's toes first contact the ground. Both subjects have similar biomechanics at this point as they initiate their reactive postural control mechanism. This mechanism involves eccentric contraction of the gastrox, soleus, quadriceps, and gluteus maximus. The second phase is mid-eccentric phase. This occurs at the midpoint between initial contact and maximum knee flexion. Postural control has become reactive as the plantar flexors, knee extensors, and hip extensors contract more forcefully concentrically. The soleus is stabilizing the ankle joint. The athlete on the left shows a faster quadriceps and glute max firing rate as they fight against the force of gravity. This is evident by the decreased time to mid-eccentric phase compared to the non-jumper on the right, as well as larger hip and knee angles at mid-eccentric phase. The non-jumper lacks balanced base of support and adequate ankle flexion upon forceful weight bearing, as well as experiencing greater than 90 degree angle of knee flexion, which shows quadricep weakness and reliance on glutes to fight gravity. The third phase is max knee flexion. This is where the body has decelerated completely and muscles are switching from eccentric to concentric contraction, known as the amortization phase. This is where we see maximum weight acceptance for both subjects. Once again, we see the athlete reached his complete deceleration in less time than the non-jumper. Base of support of the athlete falls within a normal plumb line and the patella tracks properly over the toe. From the sagittal view, the non-jumper has an anterior plumb line, poor base of support with forward weight shift and increased patellar stress due to the knee positioning. Max knee flexion in the anterior view also shows the non-jumper's right knee entering genu valgus, which would confirm weak hip extensors and external rotators, weak quads, and tight ankle dorsiflexors. The final phase is full extension, where the subjects both continue to concentrically contract However, due to the non-athlete's poor base of support and center of gravity, she begins to fall forward on full extension. At the hip, the acetabulum glides posterior on the femur, the femur glides anterior on the tibia, and the tibia glides posterior on the talus. Now our analysis for drop from knee height. Initial contact remains the same as drop from hip height with the subjects utilizing their reactive postural control mechanism. This drop from a shorter height, 16 inches compared to 33 inches, produced less force on the subject's bodies. Therefore, both the athlete and non-jumper non have much more comparable results. Mid-eccentric phase shows similar weight-bearing mechanics with only a slight increase in knee and hip flexion in the non-jumper. Just as the drop from hip height, the plantar flexors, knee extensors, and hip extensors eccentrically contract. Max knee flexion still shows the athlete's muscle firing rate is twice as efficient at fighting this level of gravitational force. However, though the firing rate is still accelerated for the athlete, the ankle, knee, and hip mechanics at full knee flexion and max weight acceptance are very similar. Knee and hip angles are equated, plumb lines are both within the center of gravity, and knees properly track over the toes. We also note in the anterior view that the non-jumper shows much less genu valgus with decreased force demands.